We're on to our featured performer for the evening. Hayden Wayne is our feature, and he's got copies of his books, chapbooks, CDs, and libretti. Hayden Wayne was born on March 2nd, 1949. He's a composer and librettist, maybe one of the first in his generation to take the rare route through pop rock music's highest levels to achieve a firm synthesis of these ideals with classical traditions. His father, Philip Wayne, gave him his earliest training in music, beginning with piano at age four. At five, he played tenor drum in the orchestra pit for the production of The King and I, which his father was conducting. He performed his first original composition in concert at the age of 11. He won a second prize medal for piano solo from New York State Music Award at age 15. The 70s saw him performing in the pop rock world for such major label-backed bands as Man of CBS Records and Joe Bryant of Elektra Records. He toured with the likes of Sly Stone, Jimmy Page, The Yardbirds, Billy Joel, Gordon Lightfoot, Gladys Knight, Richie Havens, and The Fifth Dimension. Eventually tired of touring, he returned to composition. In his unique position with the classical training and a wealth of pop and rock experience, he began experimenting with the synthesis of various genres and styles. In 1983, Wayne opened a new theater, the Taper II, for the Mark Taper Forum in Los Angeles with his metaphorical circus, Wire. He won $10,000 as national first place in 1987 from the National Institute for Music Theater with Neon, a street opera. In 2000, Neon won an additional $25,000 in the International Prague Opera Competition. He was commissioned to write In Memoriam, a celebration by the Interfaith Concert of Holocaust Remembrance. The work was premiered at, the Saint, at Saint John the Divine in New York in 1993. Subsequently, this work was linked with Sinfonietta No. 1, The Klezmer, and an elegy into madness. The combined pieces were specifically commissioned for the 50th anniversary of Israel and titled A Triptych, which received its world premiere at Mandel Hall, the University of Chicago, in January 1998. In February 1995, his Symphony No. 4, Funk, had its world premiere at the Janáček Theater in Bruno, the Czech Republic. It sold out in one week, seven, in one week, seven months in advance, and was requested to be part of the 20th Century Music Festival and performed at the, at the Rudolfinum in Prague, October 21st, 1995. The recording of the work would ultimately find itself on the music playlist of President Bill Clinton's Air Force One. On the 25th of November, 1998, as part of the reopening ceremonies of the Spanish synagogue in Prague, the Rosenberger Variations had its world premiere in front of a standing room only audience, including 15 heads of state and a representative from the Vatican. Mr. Wayne also has several film scores and award-winning commercials for television to his credit. To date, Hayden Wayne has written over 400 compositions. Here he is, the host of our evening, Hayden Wayne. structure of space-time and the study of structure of space is called geometry. If, as the pre-dynastic Egyptians believed, it isn't how we talk, but how we vibrate. If my whole life has been with the witness and documentation of tonal vibration, then I am the living embodiment of music and matter itself as geometry in motio, variations of vibrations in the very structure of space-time. George Orwell and Otis Huxley are in the house tonight. Have we really lost control of our governance? Did 
deja vu all over again. Sleep no more. We don't have anything to believe in. We're invisible. How many worlds have come to an end? It's time to take note of ourselves. Eden is closer than we think, nestled between the Tigris, Euphrates, Araxes, and the Pisan, also known as the Greater Zab, swaddling her new progeny. But she evaporated before our witness. Enoch, great-grandfather of Noah, was approached by watchers who showed him the Garden of Righteousness, where the four rivers of paradise take their rise, while another leads to the home of the angels. Is this the Eden we misplaced? Somewhere in Armenia Major, in the plain of Marsh, beneath the expanse of congealed lava, the very vessel of our birthing, no more, no less, as what we leave when we shuffle off our mortal coil. Were these lava flows the protecting fiery sores of the cherubim? This placenta which allows the entrance of our souls? Were angels directed our purpose? But we chose to sleep as we sleep now, where these spirits that thought for us because we chose not to navigate our own moral compass. Vanished are our birth awakenings. Arid sand is all that remains. The lushness that once so nurtured and loved us seems a distant fantasy of improbable proportion. Hatred through a singular parochial justification burns. How short-sighted and limited this vision juxtaposed the totality of totality. But some of us keep digging down older, deeper. Obviously, we had a purpose. Obviously, we forgot it. Obviously, we've been here longer than we realize. Obviously, where did we come from? Why did we forget? Somewhere within Armenia Major, so many thousands of years ago, before the genocide of 1915, and is now Eastern Turkey. Thomas Jefferson is sitting in prison for sedition and efforts to stifle his eloquence about inalienable rights. Extradition papers have been filed on Benjamin Franklin, who was taken sanctuary at the Hellfire Club in Paris. And John Adams, a champion of the highest possible aspirations of the law, has been disbarred. I am the only white on this uptown rush hour D train. The first time I ever saw a person of color was when I was seven years old and in the second grade. Coming home from my first day of school, my mother asked, how was it? In complete awe, I responded, referring to my new teacher. Her name is Mrs. Powell, and she's golden brown. Though youthful memory may often prove fleeting, I do remember that school year is non-traumatic. What? Would a morning be without the man on the crowded subway platform trying to play jazz renditions as if he were wearing gloves? The continuum of sloppiness falls upon the deaf and butted. I made my escape onto the next train. Two snot sniffers on either side of me. I hold my breath not to be contaminated. The doors burst open. The concophonous man swarm engulfs any sanitary rope. 
I read over the shoulder of a fellow passenger. Three elephants escape from a St. Louis circus, damage two vehicles. How long they had been planning their escape was not known, but their driving skills, let alone the assumption that they could drive, was delusional. No one was hurt, only their parade. Everyone seems oblivious. No one takes to the streets anymore, other than foreign nationals complaining about their own government's mistreatment of their people back home. Pleading for our government to help them when our own citizenry won't even help itself. Yeah, Bill, you didn't in hell. Neither did Monica. Turning a new leaf as a haberdasher for Adam and Eve. Perhaps a fig leaf, depending on the size of the fruit. At least you don't have to worry about an end seam. Somebody's got to listen if you don't know how to think. Soon enough, you will not. So? Should I take it from a book or a tree or maybe a table? Ah, that's the rub. So many choice. Maybe it will spring as spring does, surprise me with the change of life's renewal, helping forget the death that has numbed for far too long. And as I feel the ardor start to rush again within my veins, the fragrance of your being will fill me with rapture, so many scented flowers to capture as I hold you in my arms. For once upon time stood, still as perfection does, but you have awakened what can no longer remain perfect, static no more, it moves. And you and I, with this now endless tide, are constantly turning, perpetually reborn as seasons change, as does this tree bear fruit, not once, but forever. Time is only time because of change, whether perfect within a singer nano moment or the endless continuum of striving for perfection, which inevitably is always just out of reach within the space of choice. This consciousness, this plucking of the fruit from paradise has set us into motion. The leaves turn, covering something new, exposing something else that has always been, but nonetheless, always the more. So, shall I cover the beauty of your perfection with the shame of my ignorance? Or shall the voluptuous innocence of our nakedness please our sensuality to explore endlessly all that is possible? Timeless is as timeless does the turning of leaves, of death and renewal, of things to pass and things to come, of you and I and us as one, as leaves that turn and turn and turn. Here's a sonnet. How harsh this light upon my faith does stand, with chilled indifference and color waning. This loneliness is all that holds my hand, my heart in flood with love now overstraining. How slender is this thread we call emotion, a tempest sea wind tossed so soon to break, and yet so deep lies calm within this ocean, unfathomed hope for vows with one to make. I swear upon the stars when I do find you, enraptured in galactic frozen time, united and completely yours, this is true. Our world's becoming one and so sublime. For once upon a time of futures past, 
This love of ours that was will always last. Siren, a hound in heat, how blows this wind? Primordial cries, fresh, scented, distant memories of what's to come. Hear, hear her howl, oh, how she blows, dripping with impending consequences. She presses, resistance awakens, limitless forces unbound, such a scream. Feel her deep kiss, uniting her being pressed against you. No separation, how you bend to her will, moaning, poised, breathless, distant, gone. A fork in the road, two trees of knowledge of good and evil, of regaining one's spiritual identity and immortality. But the Lord said, Look, man has become as one of us. Was it the Lord? Or a taskmaster afraid of losing the ability to enslave us? Who was this highest power who scattered us across the earth, separating our language in unity, releasing continual war and genocide? History carved in stone. Mesopotamia, before the Hebrews. The story of Gilgamesh, where Abnadupashtim, before Noah, rode out the flood. A fork in the road. Dry land or water. Babylonian and Assyrian tablets of the scorched earth before the rains of the intricate systems of dams and dikes to control the erratic flooding of the Tigris and Euphrates built Mesopotamia, only to be destroyed. Cleanse the earth from threat of evolution, taskmasters remaining in control, a fork in the road, eaten, soured, we, naked, not from self-conscious shame, but from performing laborious tasks, the humiliation of enslavement, under the fully clothed of power, a fork in the road, the all-consuming chore from birth to death, trapped within the physicality of mortality versus the enlightened, perpetual state of higher consciousness. That is from Dog is My Co-Pilot. That is that. Okay. This is between the ears, behind the eyes, and from the heart. This is called Busby Berkeley Bananas, the Soliloquy of Madness. A downward thrust banana into peanut butter spread, add not so ripened raspberries to stale white frozen bread, while butter of an endive dripping from a stick pushes yellow mellow custard through a leaden brick. Thrice I laid upon you, and thrice you did get off, and thrice a weighted matrix, and thrice a heavy cough. The days and nights accost you with a pleated grace, but only God can make a tree, and that's what bugs the race. One day, while walking through the park, I came across two lesbians sucking face on a bench. I was immediately impressed by their unflinching determination and found myself first thinking, well, I guess they don't have a place to go. 
and then realized I had stopped because I was hypnotized by their unrelenting passion. I couldn't take my eyes off of them. It was an awesome dis demonstration of lust, and their desire seemed unfathomable. As they plunged further into each other's mouths, I felt my own tongue's desire to reach as deep as their mutual need to express the feelings they had for each other. Their desperation was humbling. No fear. Total abandon. And as pure a demonstration of love I knew was physically possible, no matter how fleeting it may ultimately prove. Suddenly I became aware of my voyeurism, not that I was making a moral judgment or experiencing some s sexual titillation, but felt the arid reality within my own life and how sexual passion was a distant memory. How did it come to this? Why was I now on the outside looking in? How I still long to kiss and be kissed like that, floating in the endless intimacy of such wetness, gloriously pushing on and on into the infinite reaches of what we all hold most precious, oneness. I view this kiss the way you might a distant oasis with its succulent rewards, but more a mirage of this traveler who is so terribly parched in a vast desert of dry pecks and air kisses. Did you ever notice those of us who are more into distortion? For instance, the ones who get out of the surf and just lay down in the sand with nothing between them and their newly encrusted kink, but the growing passivity of indifference at least if they would lay down on the wet sand just beyond the surf, too compacted to noticeably dislodge. But no! Dry, arid sand crusted all over their backs and in their hair. It doesn't phase them. The sand in the car that never gets swept away is no different from the sink of dirty dishes that somehow never seems to get washed, the bed that never gets made, or the scattered coffee cups with various residuals of grinds that are strewn all around the way a dog marks his territorial imperative. The encroaching clutter simply gets stepped over. I marvel at all the seating surfaces that no longer can serve their purpose because something has been tossed there. I don't think the randomness of leaving the lights on in rooms when one doesn't intend to return or the toilet that doesn't get flushed is an act of the absent-minded, but a pathology predicated upon anger and resentment, a total rejection of authority and order. I live in an environment of constant chaos. I wasn't raised this way, and with every attempt of my wishes for any semblance of order and the discipline to keep it in such form, in what seems to be a continuum of psycho babble, I'm accused of OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder. Simply put, it's exhausting. Sometimes I even feel as if the clutter is seeping into my mind by osmosis. In my travels, I've witnessed souls who scratch their ass and smell their fingers, as well as those who pick their nose and eat it. I find it impossible to walk anywhere without coming across someone, or more aptly a crowd, who has found it necessary to pierce their bodies and illustrate themselves into the singular identity of the global tattoo artist, proudly wearing their momentary impulse that locks them in time. What is this bloodlust of nihilism? I was taught there is a level of accountability to oneself and those we frequent. Our bodies and our consciousness are the most precious gifts. Sharing is everything. And yet I find myself sinking deeper into the chaos of indifference and self-destruction around me that grows exponentially at an alarming, rapid, devolving rate. Try to find someone who's willing to give service let alone talk to you civilly. It's as if hope has all but disappeared, and the final vestige of greed and taking care of number one is fueled by the fear and want of Armageddon. Now, me, mine, fuck you, fuck everybody. 
No accountability, no responsibility, no humility, no humanity, voyeurism, the unwillingness to take control, the need to be perpetually entertained, the inability to still oneself. The concept of collaboration doesn't even register. It's everyone else's fault. If these nihilists were truly in tune, honest, educated, and with any sense of consequence of action, with proper sentence syntax, they would say, I humbly beg your pardon. Excuse me for encroaching into your awareness. But since I have, would you please be kind enough to excuse me while I continue to fuck myself into total destruction? Or better yet, they would simply disappear, herd themselves like lemmings racing for the sea, and with one big flush, the earth and air could breathe a sigh of relief, cleansed from this nihilistic self-indulgence that screams for more than equal time while contributing nothing to warrant the minimum of an equal voice. sit out at sea, yearning to find your safe harbor once more. How I long to nestle along your warming shore. You are most generous. I kissed you with the passion of a wild man, deprived of such abundance for so long, but still aware of all that is possible. How I undid you and how you allowed yourself to be undone, the spreading of your desire and all the succulence it brought forth. I embraced your teeming shore as you sheltered me once more, surrounding me, securing me again within you. Through all the tranquility of time and space, there is my addiction just to see your face. I am so lost in every place without you. Show me where to come. Once again, I wish to enter your luscious harbor, the receptiveness of all your lips and my need for repeated sips of the elixir to heal my arid void within. Flood me with your warming spring, refreshing this thirsty being, your legend that I now must sing for all eternity. The other who makes me whole, as if we were but just one soul. A sea so still begins to roll. A tidal wave is rising, pushing me to your waiting arms. And as I slip into your port so deep, I'll more securely. You will hold me fast and safe and dispel my fears and wanting, I will be at rest, finally at rest, once more a welcomed rest with you, whom I call home. The clothes you wear are nothing but a transparent veil to your nakedness, and in the rain your kiss demonstrates all that is possible. Your body receives me as does your mouth, rich with understanding, giving anything, everything, to be freely explored. 
And every time it rains, I think of our first kiss, the impenetrable wetness, as if all the world were locked within our embrace, reaching for the center of our being, united in our desperate cause, a single raindrop awash in millions, warm, safe, and one. Dark, descending, alone, we took liberties, desire, crashing, raging, the elevator held secret our short descent, open doors, light, eyes greet us, our heavenly journey still climbing, we stealthily disappear through the swarm. Over 19, reckless 18, defying discovery 16, 15, gravity 14, surrounded 13, upturned eyes 11, press 10, you to me 9, 8, your willingness 6, 5, oh my god, 3, 2, 1. Adrift, weightless. Memories fade, ripples on a pond, enveloped into glass, one with the horizon, indiscernible, forgotten, haunted, a hangnail on an island pulling the tranquil smoothness, disrupting continuity, now blemished, forever changed, a torn psyche, incapable of returning, entering and exiting on a mere whim, regardless of the wake which widens with time, leaving an indelible afterglow, phosphorus burning just below the surface, a fire smoldering beneath the heaving swells, breathing, sighing, refusing to calm itself. The moon stares obsequious, then indifferent, as does your face, drifting in and out behind the clouds. Reflections in a murky pond of constellations, celestial dandelions, a cornucopia of wonder. I find myself fixed upon the nebula Glorianus, through whose portal new worlds are to be explored. Time and space are of no consequence. We are all that matters, locked in a single embrace since the beginning of creation. Obsession, it hurts so good. A nosebleed at a time, pick the scab until it tears, scratch the darkest space and smell your fingers. A crowded room of adulation, yet take the beeline to the one who yawns. Is enough ever enough? As a seeker of wisdom and truth, I sail the seven seas and long for human touch from women who aim to please. So humbled by their knowledge, I drop down to my knees, submerged in thought by things they taught, visions one rarely sees. Once upon a voyage, I sought someone so dear and sliced through endless darkness so I could hold her near. At the time, I did not know it. I had not yet seen her smile, but compelled was I to find her mile after endless mile. The ports of coal were many like stars that filled the sky, a bounty of such rich wonder for this mariner to try. But in spite of all my conquests, I kept thinking of her face, the way she held and kissed me, and her exquisite grave. I was wrapped in my huge ego with so many dreams to fill, but nothing as important as my need to hold her still. Ripples on the water, a moon-filled night so clear, and through my years of searching, your soul I still hold dear. Did I not pay attention and let you slip away? For now, with many demons, I still look for you today. 
Where is this lost perfection? Where is thy love so true? Where ends my constant yearning? Are you searching for me too? Between the ears, behind the eyes, and from the heart. How are we doing time-wise, Robert? You're about third. I'll do something from my choral symphony, which is the sixth symphony. This is the Garden of Eden. Adam. Adam. Fire. Blood. Adam. Adam. Esh. Esha. Aleph Yad Sheen. Aleph Sheen Ray. Adama. conscience that you keep. I am Eve. I, I am. I always was Aduma. I, Esha, always will be Eve, the completion of yourself. Water, bread, earth. You feel because I feel. You taste because I taste. You hurt because I hurt. You are the wine I drink. I am the bread you eat. Time has come for you to understand. Eat this fruit. Learn all there is to learn. Open up to all there is to know. If you resist, you will never change the way you are, Aleph Yad Shem. Without me, you will always be at war. Fire. Blood. Eat this fruit. Time begins with you and I, our first embrace. We eat the fruit from paradise, release our immortality, and start anew. Start anew. Such a static state before our kiss, not knowing what we would miss, but we were born. And now the tree of life awaits our tender care. Our tender care. Plant your seeds inside of me, and we will bear the children of the world. Lift your eyes on high. Behold who has created thee. Breathe the sweetness of the earth and the refreshing waters of the sea. And all our children who are born into this world, into this world to come. That's from Barking at the Moon and other conversations with the sun. Another choral symphony, symphony number nine, The Hoop of Life. He is a he Kalahina da Ganika Gai Aye Yadan Togi Hotaguga, unale awi di sekapi, kalaga wi teno trejeno, akwajeji to higo wata, ya yaga no wata, ale yi yan tadisatasi, o seginigo hi na lucida, a yeli, e doda, ale aji alohi, gaga usita e gardena, siku ala siku, cargo di, a sekoni go to her di awisa, I did tani ha di gal sa tane ha. E wansa he gesa, no yan de ne ha. I ju li hananak si ha we na dina. Si ku i da e sa elohi. Alewi so 
tota nu alia lisa nu ko ile i gohida ko gesa tla gohusiti yo gadali gayulani gada egi le la on this evening of the full moon, I embark. I am walking in the middle of your soul. Hear my voice as it carries on the wind. Face the east and see my smile, which will warm you and remind you of how it has always been between Father Sky and Mother Earth how we are born again and again for the harvest, how we grow wise with the ripening of our endeavors, united under the stars, one with the universe, suspended in time, now and forever. We ask for nothing. We have already, already been given everything. To be one with the Great Spirit, to be conscious for every day is sacred, to be responsible for your actions, to be truthful and honest, to love Mother Earth and all that dwell upon her, to benefit all mankind, to give assistance and kindness wherever needed, to do what you know to be right, to cherish the well-being of mind and body to dedicate a share of your efforts to the greater good, to be, to be human. Face the east and see my smile, which will warm you and remind you of how it has always been. Self, 
completing the soul, completing the unity, completing the hoop of life.